Welcome. My name is Gina Timberman, and you are listening to Timber People, a podcast about people who, like timber, are strong, build and create, who gather us together like fuel that feeds fire. People who support structures of our community that uplift and protect. I am so excited today to welcome my dear, beloved friend, Shoshana Wasserman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Oh, I've been excited about this. I'll tell you, uh, we've been in the trenches for many years, and I can't thank you enough for your hard work, your warrior ways, your commitment to what is now the First Americans Museum. And I've, I'm so excited to dive in. I imagine that this will be one of many conversations, updates about what is happening with you and what is happening with the First Americans Museum and all of the wonderful things that you are connected to in Indian country. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. (laughs) Man, you've been so busy. I'd say let's clone you, but I don't think you'd even have time for that surgery. (laughs) (laughs) Nor do I think we need that out there in the the wilderness. (laughs) But um, Shoshana is Papako and connected to the Muscogee Creek Nation as well. And I've known you for many years. You were the first employee in the trenches with me. We've had a lot of great uh, experiences in our journey together, professionally and personally. But I want to talk today about you, what's going on with the museum, and what's on the horizon. Right. Well, it's a really exciting time. And I'm really glad you reflected back. And if I can take just a moment to, you know, look back at this project. It's always had its own life, you know, cycle, life force. And um, you were so instrumental in so many of those very early years to, you know, go out across Indian country and a lot of different stakeholder groups and try to talk to people about an idea when nothing existed. And that was such a challenge. And I've always been so um, amazed and respectful and appreciative of the groundwork that you laid. I, You know, one time you and I were talking years ago, and I loved the analogy you gave. And I have used this exact same analogy so many times. And that is like, there are so many people that have had this idea for this museum, you know, whether it's going back to the Mabel Cozad that right. Enoch Kelly Haney talked about or many others in the community. You know, Iola Hayden back in at the University of Oklahoma and even my own mom in the 60s was part of that group where they were imagining a place, a gathering place in an urban environment that could be a home. And it was people like, Enoch Kelly Haney, you know, the late Senator Kerr, you, Tommy Thompson, so many others. And one of the things that you said to me early on that I loved was it's like a baton race. There's so many different hands that have touched this place, that have sheltered the idea, the heart of this place. And at different times, that baton gets handed to the next one. And I feel very fortunate Um, and very honored to have been in the trenches with you in those early years, and then to, in some small way, be handed that baton. And there, it's an exciting time right now because, you know, we're two years out from our grand opening. We opened in September 2021 after, you know, three decades of thinking and planning and, and, you know, hoping and dreaming. And um, that was such an exciting time two years ago. I'm very grateful that Enoch Kelly Haney was there to be there on opening day and see his big dream. I know he talked to you and I a lot about dream big, you know, um, and, and then go after those dreams. And so, so rewarding to see him see this whole project come to fruition. Then we've as you know, we've had such a tremendous group of leaders from uh, Governor Anatubby, Greg Wadley, Ken Ferguson. Oh, my goodness. The the list just goes on and on and on. And each one of those people, you know, they had this idea for this world-class destination. Mm -hmm. And there were so many times along the way, uh, you, I know, um, really, you know, made sure 
that along with those other leaders that we held to that original vision, because we could have carved this project up and probably delivered it in a lot of different ways many years before, but it wouldn't be what it was always envisioned to be. And so I'm just so very appreciative for that journey and to just be one small link in that chain. You're not just one small link in that chain. You know, I tell you, it is like building a house. You know, when I thought about doing Timber People, it's about people who build and create and support structures of our community that uplift and protect. I believe places like the First Americans Museum, places like that do that. And so you have to have strong foundation. You have to have people that uplift and protect. You've always been one of those people. I met you many years ago with the Great American Indian Dance Company and have always had great respect for your commitment and your relationship and the great work that you have accomplished in our community and representing Native culture and uh, cultural expression. And to have that opportunity to work with you has been an incredible blessing and it's been a great honor And I can't thank you enough for being one of those timber people that uplift and protect and stay true to the vision that our leaders have had for this project. And I know that we're still on our journey. We're still on our way with building the museum. But I want to ask before we go into some of the initiatives that are really central to the work that you're doing, what really inspired you to work in the museum world and to work with Um, tribes in this capacity and with community, Native and non-Native alike, but also for cultural tourism and the awareness and understanding of cultures and our voice? Yeah, that's a that's a big question, you know, but it really just comes from the heart. It comes from the fact that as Native peoples, our stories have never been told. They've never been heard by most people in this country. And this, we are the first peoples of this country, and yet we're the most invisible. And that has, you know, a, an opportunity to be different. We're such great contributors and great neighbors and great, you know, we have such great values with regard to perseverance. I mean, you and I are great examples of that. We're descendants of people who were never from this part of the country. But through, you know, a forced removal, um, we we are the descendants of those people who made it here and reestablished themselves. I'm so very proud of my grandfather, Sandy Dakin. Uh, he helped reestablish La Paco Tribal Town here in Indian Territory um, so many years ago. And I can't imagine what that was like to be in a new place, new land, new you know, knew everything and yet have the strength and and courage and understanding to start all over again, you know, and rebuild and rebuild a healthy, happy community. And so those are my underpinnings. That's what is at, at my heart. And I love what you said. You know, we one of the very first exhibits that opened at First Americans Museum was an exhibit about the architecture, you know, and the building and creating of this museum. But Kimberly Rodriguez and Jim Pepper Henry, who co-curated that exhibit, Kimberly came up with this term heart architecture. And her whole vision, and you know, in those early years when we there was nothing out there and we were building right. building structures, and she was going around and she was photographing pair of gloves that were on the ground or a nut or a bolt or this, you know, just these elements of structure that would later become this home. And nobody saw those little minuscule details and realized there's a person behind that pair of gloves or that assembled that, you know, building structure. And and that's what this is all about. You know, Mm -hmm. sure, the museum shares the collective story of the 39 tribes that are in Oklahoma today, some of which were were always here. Um, but it is about people like timber people. It is about who are all those nameless faces, right. you know, those that that early group of individuals that you and others gathered together to just the working group. You know, we just honored uh, several of those people recently. Those early ideas of what do we want this place to be? What should it do? 
And then now we look back and we measure, have we met that goal, you know? And um, so I think more than anything, it is just about creating a home for everyone and not just Native people. My, My greatest hope is that when people come to the museum from all over the globe, whether it's international tourists, national visitors, um, whether it's local people, whether it's our native constituents who have never seen themselves in a place like this. I hope everybody walks in and finds the connections with each other as human beings. And I hope that by the time they walk away, while they will have been exposed to a set of histories that perhaps they're not familiar with, um, more importantly, They walk away with something very personal in their own lives because, let's face it, we're not a place that anyone has to go to, right? right? We're a museum. We're discretionary. But the fact that somebody would take time out of their lives to come and want to understand, you know, some of the histories that make up this country's history is, is pretty powerful. And it just shows us. That even in the in the times when we can seem the most divided, um, there we always have more in common than we do have different. That's beautifully said. You know, museums today are really that redefinition of what museums were in the past. It really can be a point at which magic happens. You learn something and you have fun and you know, these safe middle ground spaces where native, non-native alike, native who that may be the only opportunity to learn about their cultural identity and history. And so building spaces like that are important. I'll never forget us like just touching those uh, building piers that were going into the ground. They were going to be there forever. And so to know that what has been built Um, you know, as a result of those early days is so important. So I greatly appreciate the passion, uh, the commitment that you've had. When I think of you, I think about that. I think about the love you have for Native people. Think about your hardworking ethic. I think about your connection to community. I think about your family. Man, I can't say enough wonderful things about what it's meant to have your family in the trenches with us at so many different times. And so uh, that's been really fantastic. And shout out to Sandra Madrano. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, the kids have all grown up um, at the museum before it was even being built. And uh, my nephew just said something really funny the other day. He's 10 years old, Nagosi. And, um, you know, we're building uh, the Family Discovery Center. And at the early stages, when we started conceptualizing the Family Discovery Center several years ago, he was so excited because he was going to be one of the first kids in there that got to test all of the, you know, the games and, and activities that took place. And just the other day, he goes, he calls me Mama Jane. He said, Mama Jane, he said, now I'm going to be a teen volunteer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when this I mean, opens. <laughs> yeah, your family, they've been you know, trained over there in the camps. And so, you know, I say that, you know, I know we have a family discovery center that will be built and it's multi-generational, like whether you're three or, you know, 83, you could enjoy it. And so I really envision when that is up and operating and open to the public after the beautiful design that's been created um, that uh, I could see your whole family in there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is whole family engagement. You know, that's something that's important in our Native communities. A lot of our homes were multi-generational, all in one home. A lot of cultures are like that. And, you know, I think during COVID, we really realized the need for human interaction and connection, you know, And that has even made this particular piece of the project even more meaningful and special. But, you know, when we, going all the way back to the early days, we always had, you know, many different galleries that would do different things, and we designed them all very differently. So we have the Oklahoma Exhibition, which is phenomenal, that is rich in storytelling and media and, you know, um, really it covers both that historic journey, but it also brings us into the contemporary moment, you know, and shares how we're part of the cultural fabric of today. And it, you leave, you know, really uplifted. You go through a really, you know, difficult and challenging 
history, but you leave understanding what resilience and perseverance means. And then you go upstairs and you go to the Winnico exhibition. And, you know, here we're celebrating all of these co- uh, uh, collections that, you know, they have a life all of their own. All of these cultural materials were collected here at the turn of the century. They went on a journey of their own, w- eventually winding up in Suitland, Maryland with, at the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in their Cultural Resource Center. And we went out into community and we began to work with those community members to understand what do those cultural materials mean to us as people. Each one of those items are created with love, with purpose, with design motifs, but they belong with our cultural peoples. And so now here that has come full circle, right. you know, and, and, and we, you know, in the course of that work, there were many people who began to recognize some of the names, you know, associated with the early makers of these pieces. And when we began to recognize those names, research was done. And there, at the time when the exhibition came to First Americans Museum from D.C., we were able to reunite Mm -hmm. some of these families together with the descendants of the original makers. Mm -hmm. What an amazing, amazing once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do something like that, where you have this great-great-great-granddaughter who is holding this Modoc basket Mm -hmm. that, you know, was you know, with her peoples, you know, on the on the West Coast. And, you know, when they were, you know, fled into the lava pits right. and had to hide out and then had to make this journey on cattle cars to this place and then a 40-mile journey to where the Modocs are right. located today. I mean, what a powerful testament through cultural materials, right. you know. Right. So those two galleries are just, and they're ambitious, no one had ever, you know, taken on this task of really taking all of the 39 tribes that are in Oklahoma today and trying to share that collective story. What are the common circumstances? What are the things that are very different amongst our, our nations and our cultural life ways? And so that was really, really powerful. Well, at that same time, we were also trying to deliver a different kind of experience. You know, those exhibits are very dense. There's a lot of, you know, reading. There's a lot of history. There's there's a lot to take in. It's really almost more than you can take in in the course of a day. But we also know that there's families out there. And, you know, these families have, like you said, grandma that's 103 and the three-year-old and the 10-year-old and the 15-year-old. <laughs> and we want them all inside a space that is safe, that is fun, that is exciting. And so this, you know, sort of edutainment. Well, my background is in education. You know, my undergraduate degree is in education. That's my love and passion because I feel like when we seed new ideas in young people, we grow the future Mm -hmm. that we hope to grow. And so when you take that and you couple that with our elders and, you know, and, and sometimes it's not our elders. Some of our culture keepers are not the oldest in our society, but they, re, they have the knowledge. And right. we found that out in our work together, yes. you know. And so we've tried to create a space that embraces all of that, but that is a lot of fun. So the Family Discovery Center, you know, at its highest level, you know, the overarching theme is we're all connected. Yes. And that is something that we as human beings and as global societies, the sooner that we can return to those ideas of unity, the better we will all be, you know, and the better the planet will be. And so we thought that was really important. And then as we began to contemplate this exhibit and how will we create this fun, activity-oriented, you know, energized living world, um, we began to kind of reflect inward on values, just as we have in the other exhibits. And so we identified four values, community, respect, resilience, and stewardship. Mm -hmm. And these are not 
you know, native centric values. Right. These are human values. Absolutely. We can all relate to these ideas. But we did take what makes us unique in our native communities with regard to community or resilience or stewardship or, um, you know, these different ideas. We leaned into our clan systems. And so we began to bring to life a world that was imagined. And uh, and many of you and, and the people listening will remember when I was a kid, I just absolutely loved these pop-up books. I know, me too. You would open the pages and the world would pop up yeah. in front of you and all of a sudden you were drawn in and you were engaged. So we worked with the fabulous design group, Storyline Studios, and we said at the very onset of this exhibit design, we want it to feel like a giant pop-up right. book. Wow, what an experience <laughs> that was, you know, to create this 5,000 square foot, two-story space that was going to feel like a pop-up world. Right. But we did it. And there, the space is divided up into those different value zones. And then our, our clan animals, they show up and they help guide us through all of the different fun activities and experience. And there's a lot of, you know, experiential learning that's taking place, but not in such a didactic, linear kind of fashion. And really, this is more closely related to how we as Native people mm -hmm. have learned and passed down our histories in our communities. It's, it, it's through storytelling. It's through experiences. It's through um, being honored as a young com community member. So for one example, in community, we lean into the Rabbit Dance Society right. amongst the Kiowa people. Well, this is how their young people learn their roles in community. This little rabbit dance society, which started out boys only, mm -hmm. their responsibility, Kiowas were migratory people. And so as they were getting ready to move their encampment, it was the rabbit dance society that would go and, you know, make sure that that whole area was, um, you know, uh, clean and, and left pristine the way they had found it. And, you know, for right. safety purposes right. as well. And so they had a role within the society that was valued and taught to them at a very young, young age. Well, we've seen that rabbit dance society in modern days. You know, it continues amongst the Kiowa peoples. Now young, young girls are able to participate that. But it's still a whole society that is dedicated to teaching young children their role in society. This is how... You know, we can take lived experiences and bring it into a space like that. So we borrowed from all of those concepts. And then what actually happens in the fun game that's there is there on the floor there. It, it basically is like a giant uh, matching game. Right. But you have to form a little bit of a community because it's a big disc and turtle and a uh, um uh, Kiowa Rabbit is sitting in the middle, and in, you have to work with somebody else on the other side mm -hmm. of that circle. So now all of a sudden you understand what it means to be a community member to make these matches. Yes. So, you know, we've taken Native-centric um, ideas and values and ways of teaching and learning, and we've incorporated them into very contemporary experiences. We've also taken, taken things and we've hidden some gems in right, there right. so that for our Native people who are coming in, there's going to be some things in that space that they will see. For example, Grandma Turtle is on the outside of the uh, space and she welcomes everybody that's coming. And for our Native constituents, as they look at her, they can identify that she's Choctaw. Yeah. She has a little apron. She has like a chalk talk collar. And if you know, you know. Right. And if you don't, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. She's just that loving yeah. grandma that's welcoming you. So we've really tried to meet a lot of different cognitive levels. So there's a lot of steam inspired um, activities and and games and and we we have serious fun in there. Yeah. Um, you know, we so we we play, but we have serious fun, and we do it in a way that is natural. So you come into this living world where you meet, um, you know, all of these uh, clan relatives, all, all of our 
you know, animal relatives. You're surrounded by this giant forest that seems to go on and on because we've used the multi-plane illustrative style to make it feel like it's much right. bigger than right. the space actually is. So just, you know, it's just going to be a wonderful space. And, you know, another thing that was really, really important to us is that our teens and tweens get lost. You know, we have lots of activities for right. kids. We have activities for adults, but sometimes we don't think of that teens and tweens audience. Right. So we created a whole scavenger hunt that the littlest guys could participate in, but also as we think about different clues and different cognitive levels, the teens and tweens have to work a little harder to solve the scavenger hunt. I love it. I love it. So much creativity has really been put into the planning. It's been fun to see that evolve. And I know that um, there's still some work to do to open it to the public. What are the needs now for the First Americans Museum in actually opening this beautiful family discovery center to the community. Yeah, well, you know, we were able to open in September 2021, most of our spaces, but the family discovery center was always part of the original vision. And we are 5% away from our goal now. You right. know, this was a $190 million project. We have nine and a half million dollars left to raise in order to complete the family discovery center. We've already have uh, the infrastructure in place, it's fully designed, it's ready to fabricate. And with this last funding, we will be able to, you know, go about the business of, of bringing it to life. Grandma Turtle is sitting out there and she's <laughs> waiting for all of her clan relatives to come to life. And But we, you know, there's some urgency to this. We need to do this very quickly. And we're, we're trying to get pledges and people to commit to this idea by um, the end of the year, really, right. because as many people who are in the local community know, the museum is sitting on 40 acres, but there's a much larger right. site there. There's 300 acres that surround or that are, you know, in total. And in that area all around us is coming Okana and Horizons mm -hmm. District, where we're going to have a, you know, resort hotel with an indoor water park. And, you know, we're going to be attracting, not we as the museum, but the folks that are developing that amazing project, which is a subsidiary of the Chickasaw, Chickasaw Nation. They're going to be bringing people from all over the world, right. international tourists who can spend 14 to 20 days here. Right. And there's this amazing opportunity to welcome those families into the museum. We hope that everybody staying in that hotel will also wind up coming to the museum and, you know, spending some time at the museum. And many of their um, customers will be families. Right. And so we have to be ready in, you know, the late spring or early summer of 2025 when they open to have the Family Discovery Center ready. So we, we're ready to do it. And, um, you know, we're in the final stretch, so right. people can participate at any level. Every level is important, but anybody who participates at $1,000 or more will be considered a sponsor in perpetuity. And yeah, that's, that's, a, great. that's a pretty wonderful thing that's to great. think about, you know, becoming a part of that space, you know, forever. It's really special. You know, it goes back to building that foundation with so many people. It's like putting the threads of a fiber together. It just makes it stronger. And so the museum, our community, we all need each other. We need each other for projects like First Americans Museum, but to support in really creating that awareness and understanding who Native people are today. And I just want to say thank you so much for who you are for the work that you do and your commitment and your love for our community and bringing us together. And thank you for being on the show. I hope this, again, is one of many opportunities we have to update on the progress of the Family Discovery Center, among other things that you're doing in Indian Country. Thank you, Mado. We appreciate it so very much being invited to be here, Mado. Thank you. Yakoki. Thank you for joining us. Timber People is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform. <laughs>